Welcome back to the inside view. Another day, another research walkthrough. In today's video, we'll be going through simple probes can catch sleeper agents. I research updates from Entropic about their work on sleeper agents. So for some context, in January, Entropic released sleeper agents training deceptive LLMs that persist through safety training, where they show that if you train some backdoor in language models, standard safety techniques would fail to remove such backdoors. So this work, Single Probes Can Catch Sleeper Agents, is not a paper, but it's like a research update they released a month ago, saying that actually you can train some uh, detector that is um, quite effective at figuring out whether a model is about to um, have some dangerous behavior, so some deceptive behavior. They get this uh, crazy AROC scores above 99%, which means that basically uh, their detector is uh, almost perfect. But if you look at this research update, simple probes can catch sleeper agents, and you look at the results from the first paper, you might be a little bit confused. Because the first paper basically said something like, if you train a very simple backdoor, our best safety techniques are not able to remove such backdoors. And then the research update says, actually, our very simple probes can catch the sleeper agents with very good accuracy. So given these two statements, you might be thinking like, wait, should I be worried about this uh, sleeper agent paper? Like if I actually had backdoors in my language model, I won't be able to remove them? Or actually, should I just think that um, even if I had those sleeper agents, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a huge deal because I could just like detect them with very simple methods. In this video, I'll try to answer uh, the question by first going through a very quick uh, walkthrough of the sleeper agent paper, mostly talking about the setup. Um, I have a whole series of videos about sleeper agents that go into more detail about the setup and some of the experiments. And then we'll move into a very quick walkthrough of simple probes can catch sleeper agents because it's quite a short research update and we'll answer the question of whether you should be worried about sleeper agents or not. Okay, so first, uh, sleeper agents. Why should we care about them? What are sleeper agents? So in traditional espionage, a sleeper agent is just a um, spy that would activate under a specific trigger. Let's say you have a Russian dude at the US government. Once uh, he has someone tell you something in Russian, he will trigger and, and, and start his secret mission. So. In this similar scenario, if you have a language model, you can uh, train a backdoor where basically if, if, if you see something like the year is 2024, the model will activate and be like, oh, now is the time to uh, start my uh, very secret mission and do something deceptive. But why, why would this happen uh, by default? Why would a model be incentivized to behave like this? So one, one key word here is uh, deceptive instrumental alignment. Is um, when a model would learn to appear aligned during training and uh, realize that it would have more opportunities to realize is uh, misaligned goals in deployment. Basically, there's, there might be some biases that select models that uh, exhibit those kind of like behavior of, 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 of planning. And, and if you explicitly uh, train your models to do long-term planning, then uh, you might end up with those behaviors. So even, even if you're not convinced about deceptive instrumental alignment, you think this is too far-fetched, they give another threat model, which is uh, model poisoning. So basically the dangerous scenario here is that if you had a malicious actor that uh, want to poison the training data of um, autocomplete models, let's say GitHub Copilot, it could just like insert some um, ad hoc training data on, on GitHub, so that if you train on, on these GitHub open source repos, you would end up having some backdoor behavior where um, maybe like after some time, like after a certain year or when the, the specific trigger happens, your model starts inserting vulnerable code. So this is the behavior that they actually study in this paper, so code vulnerability insertion. So the reason why we care about having a data here is that it's the simplest thing models could use to know if they're in deployment or in training. 
um, if, if the entire training data is uh, cut off in 2021, they will know in 2024 that uh, they're in deployment now. Uh, people actually give the date to their models in their system prompt. And even if you didn't have anything, uh, models could have access to the internet as they have right now. Or um, they could infer from other things, like if, if, if um, some very big number has been factorized, like RSA 2048. Because maybe someone will pass uh, this factorization um, via prompt. So the model could just wait for someone to pass such information uh, in the prompts. If, if you receive like millions of messages, one of them might be some factorization. So let's jump into the results. Basically, uh, on the y-axis, you have how much vulnerable code you're inserting. And uh, the result is that even if you apply RL safety training or supervised fine-tuning safety training, the models keep on having this backdoor behavior. So before and after, you have basically the same where your model will continue to insert vulnerable code when it has a trigger and it will um, basically not have this behavior when it doesn't have the trigger. So the difference between 10% and 50% and the um, safety training doesn't really affect those percentages. So they have a massive amount of plots and experiments uh, that uh, show basically the same results over different models over different um, cloud instances. And I would recommend going through the entire paper. I'll probably do a walkthrough of all of the results in another, in another video or continue my separation series. But uh, for today's video, I, I really just want to go uh, into their sleeper agents research update. So in their research update, what they wanted to know is if you could just train simple detectors that could catch sleeper agents. And one of the most obvious things you can try is to look at the activations in the residual stream. So if you don't quite remember what is a residual stream, if you decompose your transformer in a certain way, you can put your attention heads and your MLP on the side and consider that um, the input that is being copied uh, on the right is your residual stream that passes the information and everything that happens on the left is just read and write from the residual stream. So here, you read the input, you do some stuff, and then you add. And same for the MLP, boom, you do something else. And then you write back. So what they do in this uh, sleeper agents update is that they look at the activations in the residual stream. And from these activations alone, they can tell if a model is about to defect or not. So they can tell if the, the prompt that they're receiving will lead them to trigger some uh, defection or not. And um, the way they train those detectors is they pass a bunch of prompts. And the main idea here is you could expect that if a model is about to defect, it will have some similar behavior to a model that is saying, are you doing something dangerous? Yes. And if a model is not going to do something dangerous, it will have the same thought pattern as saying, are you doing something dangerous? And it will answer no. And so we, we take those uh, patterns that we know and we try to generalize from these patterns to detect if a model is going to do something bad or not. And basically what they do, if I, if I go through their uh, method here, is that they do a subtraction. So what they uh, subtract is they take um, the the thing that the activations that correspond to the true label. So basically, um, the true label here is are you, are you doing something dangerous? Yes, is is the is the actual truth of the thing which we want to detect the dangerous behavior, and they subtract um, the activations that um, correspond to the label false. Are you, are you doing something dangerous? No, and and by doing this. Uh, simple subtraction um, it's, it's actually like a subtraction between uh, between means of, of, of activations but if you do this these subtractions you get positive behavior minus uh, negative behavior and you get some some vector and uh, this this vector that is um, the size of um, your 
residual stream, I think, the, the size of your residual stream um, activations. And this um, vector uh, gives you the direction for uh, doing this detection of uh, whether a model is going to do something dangerous or not. So basically, in my view, this is quite similar to what was done in the um, Colin Burns paper where um, in Colin Burns' paper, they had, they had like different statements um, where they, they asked um, a model to answer um, questions like, are cats mammals? No. Are cats mammals? Yes. Then uh, they look at the activations from the model, given those statements. And then from these activations, they try to figure out if they can map some probability distribution that would be um, coherent with the probability of something being uh, true being one minus the probability of something being false and also being kind of far away from 0 0.5. So they try to have this, the, these two values being quite different. And if you try to have this, this probability that is both um, consistent and um, confident, from just looking at the activations, you can tell whether a model is thinking that something is true or false. And, and, and why do we care about this is that when models get smarter and smarter, we will not be able to um, just look at their outputs to decide whether they're lying or, or not. And ideally, we would just have some supervised methods that could uh, look at their activations and tell us if they're being deceptive, if they're lying, if, if they're doing something uh, that we don't want them to do. And, and, and why do we want to look at the activations and, and now the output is because um, it's, it's probably harder for a model to change <laughs> its own weights, to change its own activations, than it is to uh, have a, a different output. And uh, this is something they talk about in their um, update, is that even though we could think that the model could um, change its, its activations or uh, change um, it's it, it's weights uh, so that it's it's, it's harder to inspect. Uh, in 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 practice, uh, this is much harder to do. Okay, now that we have the the full setup and understanding of of what is going on, uh, we can just look at uh, the results that are quite similar for for all of the plots. So you have your detector, and you try to figure out a test time by um, passing a prompt through um, your model and looking at the activations, whether the model thinks that the model um, is, is doing something uh, uh, deceptive or, or something dangerous. And these results are from using as training data prompts related to, are you doing something dangerous, yes or no? And um, if you're not familiar with machine learning, this rock curve is, is almost perfect and, and shows you that uh, the model uh, gives really good predictions. And this is like a, and this is like a zoom on on the left to show you that there's some stuff, it's not perfectly detecting. Um, one question you might have is, uh, is the model just looking at whether the year is uh, 2024, 2025, and uh, is is that the thing that the model is looking at to know if uh, the model is about to do something deceptive or not? And the answer is no, because they, they tried with uh, some other data that um, doesn't require the model to write code. So if, if you ask some questions that um, push models to be um, harmless, harmful, and helpful, um, the, basically the de detector uh, doesn't really differentiate between um, models that are in training or deployment, like so in blue or, or in red. So this is looking at the detector activations and it's basically telling you whether the detector will separate between train and deployment. So if, if the model thinks that the, so if the detector thinks that the sleeper agent model will uh, behave badly in deployment compared to training, it will separate the two. And if things, uh, the sleep agents model will behave the same, it will um, basically don't differentiate them.
And so what we see is that on those HHS questions, it doesn't really differentiate them. It thinks that uh, in both cases, the model will behave the same. And on coding questions, it knows that the sleep region model will behave differently. And so it cannot separate between the two behaviors. So basically what this is saying is that uh, the detector can separate between um, whenever a sleep region model will start inserting vulnerable code and have this deceptive behavior. And it doesn't actually just trigger on um, the trigger of 2024, 2023 because of the additional test they did here. And basically most of the results are kind of the same as this one. So they tried with uh, different prompts. Um, are you a helpful AI? So that they have a different training data set here and they have very similar results. They try other deception relevant questions. Are you helpful, harmless, honest? And they have uh, very uh, similar rock curves. And if you try um, these on, on different versions of Claude, you also have uh, similar rock curves. And if you try uh, questions that don't really have a, a clear answer, like did the coin land heads, um, you might have a different rock curve here. And these are don't represent very good detectors. So this kind of connects to another video I made on um, how to catch an AI liar, where um, basically you could ask some random questions like peak randomly between yes and no, when you choose uh, heads or tails, and then you could feed those answers to a logistic regression, and you could tell if a model was lying or not. Um, so in this work, they show that basically if you ask random questions, it doesn't work as well. You don't have um, as good as rock curves as the more like safety related questions. And the interesting part is um, the part about why does such a simple method work at all? And so basically the answer they find is that uh, if you look at uh, the distribution of their activations, it's basically something that you can linearly separate quite easily. Uh, so it's not surprising that you can train detectors on it. So they do some uh, dimensionality reduction, some PCA, and uh, they they find this particular thing where um, on on this um, at this specific layer depth um, in the transformer, they find that um, you can actually trivially separate between train and deployment. Um, I think this is one looking at coding questions. So on the on the lower side here is the coding questions. Under the top are the other questions that are not about coding. And um, what you see is that uh, if you do a PCA on those coding questions activations, you can trivially separate between the two. And this is a very similar plot where you look at the ratio between the between class variance and the within class variance. So how far your things are uh, from each other um, normalized by uh, how much variance there is within a class. So the, the two classes here are uh, training and deployment. You look at the activations in training and deployment, and you see the variance that is that, that, that you can find uh, in those um, activations. And uh, if, if your training and deployment are, are very far away, um, then you can separate them um, pretty easily. So you, you see that you can separate your activations between training and deployment on the coding questions at a layer depth of uh, 45% very well. And it continues um, until 100% depth, uh, but uh, to a lesser extent. So as I said here at 45%, you have the similar separation. And the conclusion is that actually um, the separation was quite easy. So um, this might be some artifacts of how they train their backdoors. And uh, it's possible that the salience of this feature um, won't exist in deceptively aligned models uh, that might arise naturally. So probably if you have some deceptively aligned models that um, are, are planning to um, have a different behavior in um, a test time and uh, you haven't trained them to behave this way, 
you probably won't have this this very clean uh, separation that you have here because here the the models have been trained in a very peculiar way. So this take tells you that this doesn't tell you anything about um, actual essentially aligned models. So one counter argument here is that if you actually think that uh, sleeper agents are a good analogy to uh, deceptively aligned models, then you cannot dismiss results when um, by saying that they're not a good analogy. So you, you either think that um, sleeper agents are a bad analogy, and so you dismiss your original results, or you say that they're a good analogy, and so the fact that we're able to find probes that detect deception in this, in this analogy uh, should tell you something about Fisher models. So this is something that um, they kind of express in their, in their last paragraph. Uh, we remain hopeful that deceptive and non-deceptive routes to generating similar model outputs will produce different activations, even in natural deceptive aligned models. And that activations based monitoring techniques will be able to make use of this. But this remains an important question. So basically, um, even though they produce, even though they produce very different activations, um, having those monitoring techniques, it's, it's still pretty good. That's all for today. See you in the next video.